You guys doing at home hopefully good we are really happy to be able to worship with you today we pray that this is a time where you're able to worship at home where you're able to bring your families in front of the TV for something other than Netflix which if you're anything like my family it's been a lot of Netflix the last few weeks and if you have a three-year-old it's a lot of how to train your dragon and if you don't have a three-year-old bless you I'm just joking I love my son. He's awesome. Lord, we thank you so much, God, that we get to do this. We thank you that we get to worship you. And we just pray, God, that, Lord, as we come before you and as we, as we worship you in our homes with our families surrounding us, God, that you would just pour your blood out on us, Father, that you would just let your blessings flow in our homes, that you would move, God, that you would touch our lives, that you would touch our hearts, and, God, that you would just be the one that's in control, Father. It says in Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I just thank you that we get the opportunity to take this time and remember what that actually means and to think about that, Lord. We serve you. We love you. And our lives are all yours. You're awesome. We thank you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.
thousand stories of what they think you're like, oh, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night as you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good friend. To you are, to you are, to you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, and I many searching for answers. For
could just take the next few minutes and invite someone to watch our live stream. Uh, we've been doing this every week. You can uh, dance with us at home if you want to, too. Um, we're going to be dancing up here a little bit. And if you don't want to, text somebody. Tell them to watch Rock Church right now. We've got a, we've got a good sermon for you.
Hey everyone, it's so great to be back with you again. This has been so fun, so different, a little strange, but we will get through this season. And I'm so thankful because of technology that we can still provide a service, an online church service. The church is alive and well. Our building is closed. We've said it every week, but the church is not. And I see you, I see you posting, I see you sharing, I see you commenting and reaching out. And right now, some of you have the, those little floating emojis going up with the thumbs up and the hearts and even a, a laugh emoji and somebody on accident hit the angry emoji and, and that freaks us out for a second, but we're okay. We know it was an accident. We know you're really just giving us some love. And, and I just wanna say how much we love you and we really do miss you. And we can't wait to be able to do a service in this building. It is strange preaching to a camera, but the reality is I know I'm not preaching to a camera. I'm preaching to you. Because right now you're with your family and you're gathered around perhaps in your living room or in your office, in your car. Maybe you're on a walk right now listening with your phone. It doesn't matter how you're watching. We're just glad that you can be watching and that you are watching. So do me a favor and take a picture of, of your family or take a picture of your screen, your family in front of the screen. It's been so cool to have some of you have already do that and you've tagged me or you've tagged the church and just make sure you use the hashtag for the 309. We want people beyond our Rock Church community to see the impact that God is having through this live stream and through technology and through you being the church by, by um, unashamedly willing to, to share a sermon, to share a Facebook post, to, to reach out to a friend, to text somebody, to call them. It's such an exciting time. People who normally aren't paying attention to the church are now paying attention to the church and they're um, participating and they're watching. And we just wanna welcome everyone right now who's watching, whether you're a part of Rock Church or whether you're not a part of Rock Church. Some of you, um, you belong to another church and you're watching this stream. And some of you belong to churches who aren't streaming and it doesn't, we're, here's the deal. Same, we have the same common denominator and that's Jesus. All right, so Team Jesus is alive and well. And I want to, speaking of team, I want to thank our tech team. I want to thank our producer, Burn. I want to thank our, all of our audio people and, you know, Chad and Mike and our technical director, OJ, and our worship team that was just on, on the stage, you know, Pastor Lance still putting it together and throwing it out and leading us into the presence of God while we worship. I want to thank Jerry last week for painting on Easter. How cool was that to see her painting as an act of worship during our service? And, and how cool was it to be able to take communion together last week online? Loved the whole experience. So we're so grateful for um, the team, not just the team that's on the stage, not the team that's just in this building right now and, and those who are, are serving. Um, Teresa, who you'll see here in a little while, she comes to the stage. We're grateful for all of our staff and all of our team, all of our leaders, all of our volunteers. We still have people behind the scenes who are serving so I can stand in front of you today. So I just want to give a huge virtual shout out. And, we, we, and I really want to give a shout out to my wife, Annette, and to my family who has allowed me to be up in my office at home, man, creating content and studying and reaching out. And, and um, even though I've been home, I've been absent a lot because I've actually been a little bit more busy during this quarantine than before. So um, I love you, Annette. So thank, thank you. All right. And uh, my kids, Savannah and Ashton and my mother-in-law, Diana, and my parents. I got to see them a couple days ago. Um, they stopped by. First time I'd seen them in, in a while. So, um, man, I just love my personal family. love our church family. How's that for a long introduction? So, um, all right, I'm going to pray. And, and then we're going to start a brand new series. It's going to be a lot of fun, all right? So let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity we have right now to be your Church. Church is not man's idea. Church is your idea. Jesus, your word says that you would build the church and the gates of hell 
wouldn't stop it. Jesus, you're the head of the church. And I thank you that we are connected to you and you chose the church to be the vehicle to advance your kingdom. So here we are advancing your kingdom through the airwaves. And I just pray right now, these next few moments, that you will open up hearts. God, for the person that's just stumbled across, who, who's never even joined us before, and they're listening because they're intrigued, I just thank you, God, that you are going to grab a hold of them. God, those that have been turned off by the church, those that have been hurt by the church because of a past negative experience, I just pray that today will be a day of healing I just pray, God, that not only we open up our hearts, just open up our, our spiritual eyes to see what you want to say to us today. So anoint my lips to preach your word in Jesus' name. And everybody at home said, amen. All right, well, we're kicking off this brand new series, and it's called Asking for a Friend. Now, you've probably seen somebody on social media ask an embarrassing question, and then they tag this at the end of it, asking for a friend. All right, so asking for a friend indicates that a question is embarrassing by pretending to be asking on behalf of another person. So I had some fun just searching memes online for asking for a friend. And be careful when you're doing that, just so you know. <laughs> There's some crazy stuff out there. Uh, I'm gonna give you 10 um, 10 asking for a friend memes. Uh, the, my favorite 10 that I found over the last few days searching online, all right? So here, here is the first one. Now, does anyone know which page of the Bible explains how to turn water into wine? Asking for a friend. All right, now I, I gotta tell you that, for the record, I, I, I don't drink. Uh, but Jesus did turn water to wine though, all right? And um, I just thought that was funny. And um, we took communion in our home um, on Easter. And um, the next day, my son came up to me with a bottle of water, but there wasn't water in it. It was, it was grape juice. And he said, hey, Dad, check out my, my grape juice. Jesus turned my water into juice. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> uh, moving on. The second one. That's grape juice, too. I don't even know. Wow. Wow. Oh. No, I've been praying that God would turn my water to Starbucks, and it hasn't happened yet, so pray for me. All right, this, the second example in my top 10 asking for a friend means, um, does the jelly in a donut really count as one fruit serving? Asking for a friend. The third one, what's the longest one should go without showering during the quarantine? Asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping... Um, Everybody in my family's watching this right now. Okay. Um, next one. Number four. What is a good church to recommend for somebody you don't like? Asking for a friend. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, oh, oh, that's for real. <laughs> All right, number five. Do vegans eat animal crackers? Asking for a friend. The next one. Number six. Asking for a friend. Does anyone have an owner's manual for a wife? His is giving off terrible whining noises. <laughs> oh, man, I know we're practicing social distancing, but if somebody could open up their home for me after that one, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, all right. Our, our, our next one is this. Is it wrong to tell someone you got a new phone and lost all your contacts when the truth is you never entered them into your phone? contacts in the first place, asking for a friend. Uh-oh. All right, number nine, asking for a friend memes. It's really hard to go through these because I'm in an empty sanctuary, so I don't know whether or not you're laughing or booing me. So maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's a good thing. All right, there's a couple people in here, and I can hear them laughing, so that... that, that, that. <laughs> <laughs> OJ's in the house. Um, all right, number 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 nine. Just just for the record, I almost spit up my coffee when I read this one. Um, when you do squats, are your knees supposed to sound like a goat chewing on an aluminum can stuffed with celery? Asking for a friend. And then the last one. 
the last asking for a friend meme today is when someone's telling you a horrible story and they're crying, how long should I wait before taking a bite of my corn dog? Asking for a friend. All right, some of those were good, some of them were bad, and, and um, there, there's maybe laughing emojis going up or angry emojis going up right now, like boo. Um, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to search for some. I'd like you to email them to me, chuck at rcpeoria.org, chuck at rcpeoria.org. And email me some of your favorite memes, and I'm going to grab some, and we'll use them next week as we continue this series. All right, so I know you might be thinking, well, what the heck does this have to do with church today, Chuck? Um, here, here's the question that we're going to ask today. If Christians really love Jesus, why is there so much hurt in the church asking for a friend? You know, and I know that with some of you watching today, that strikes a nerve because you've been, you've been hurt in a church. And some of you have been damaged by a former pastor perhaps hurt by a leader. And maybe today you're no longer a part of the church because of that past negative experience, because of that, that hurt. The reality is, and it's a sad reality, but the reality is you don't have to look far to meet someone who's been hurt by the church or in church. In fact, the Barner Research Group, they did a study among unchurched adults and they found that 37%, that's nearly four out of 10 non-church-going Americans said they avoid churches today because of negative past experiences in churches or with church people. Sexual abuse cover-ups, embezzled funds, hypocrisy, and lack of love confirm that the church is not without its own brokenness and sin. And the question is, why? Why is that? And the answer to that question is this, because the church is filled with imperfect people. Jesus came for the lost. He came for those who know they are sinners, not for those who think they're righteous. And the truth is, wherever there's people, there's going to be problems. The church is filled with people who have the capacity to sin. God has given us free will, and even though Jesus conquered sin and death, people still sin. We don't have to. Every time we're tempted, the Word tells us that God always provides a way of escape, but yet we still mess up. We still fall short. We still sin. Some people do it intentionally. Some people do it unintentionally. The bottom line is this. If you're around people, whether it's in church or out of church, eventually you're going to get hurt by somebody. So this leads us to another question. Since churches are filled with hypocrites, do I really need to be part of one? Asking for a friend. Right? And the answer is yeah. Because church is his idea, it's not my idea. It's not man's idea. The church is Jesus' idea. Jesus died on the cross. We celebrated Easter last weekend, didn't we? We celebrated Jesus coming out of a grave, and the reason he went to the cross and came out of the grave is so the church could exist. We are the church. Jesus is the head of the church. The church is the body of Christ. Jesus said that he is the one building it. The gates of hell can't stop us. So yes, you should still being a church. Just because you've had a bad experience at a restaurant doesn't mean that you have quit restaurants altogether. If you've been hurt in a church, find a new church. Find a church that's nurturing, that has people that love you, one that's preaching the word of God, but don't stay at a church because people are hypocrites. There are hypocrites everywhere. Every company has hypocrites. Every church has hypocrites. I remember driving through a Burger King drive-through. It's been a few months ago, and 
um, this particular Burger King that I, that I was at, um, I noticed that the woman who was serving me used to be a part of our church. And I said, hey, it's so good to see you. We miss you. And she's like, yeah, I miss you guys too. I really want to be there, but my husband, not so much, because he says that the church is filled with hypocrites. And I said, hey, tell him he's right. Tell him to come join us. Come to join us, all right? There's hypocrites everywhere, all right? That's, I mean, that's, that's a reason, but it can't be an excuse not to be a part of something that Jesus created, something that, that he is the head of, right? However, Jesus is not okay with hypocrisy. I don't want you to misinterpret what I'm saying. Jesus did have some not-so-nice things to say about hypocrisy. In fact, he reserved, he reserved some of his hardest critiques for the religious leaders of his day. And those words, those harsh words that he spoke to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the scribes, the Sadducees, his words still ring, his, his words still ring true for our church, the modern church. So we're going to go right to the word right now and find out exactly what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 23 is our text. Matthew chapter 23. This is Jesus speaking to the masses. It says, then Jesus said to the crowds, as I'm reading this word, this message, this word, God's word is going out to the masses. We have people that are watching and listening, not just in central Illinois, not just in the hashtag 309 region, but throughout the state, beyond Illinois, different states scattered across the U.S., and even on other parts of the globe right now. So the words that are being spoken still apply today. So here's what Jesus said to the crowds. Here's what he said to his disciples. The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you. But then he said this, but don't follow their example. Because they were a horrible example. Why? He said this, for they don't practice what they teach. They don't practice what they teach. I want to make sure that I practice what I preach, and I don't always do a good job. I want you to know that I do fall short. I do mess up. I have to confess my sins. There are times that I need to repent, sometimes on a daily basis, sometimes every 10 minutes, all right? You ever just wake up mad, angry, all right? There's nothing wrong with being mad. There's nothing wrong with being angry, but there is something wrong with allowing that anger to cause you to sin, right? But Jesus is not happy with these religious leaders because they were frauds. They were hypocrites. They were all about show. So Jesus says, don't practice what they teach. All right? Or don't, don't, or he said, practice what they teach, but don't, don't practice how they live. Don't be like them. But I want to point out that he said, you need to do what they're telling you to do because they're reading the word, right? And there are a lot of preachers in a lot of churches reading the word, and we need to obey the word, but some of those guys we should be following because of how they're living and what they're doing. And that's what Jesus is sharing here. So notice that he is encouraging the people and the disciples to do as the religious leaders say, but not as they do. All right. So just because a preacher is messed up doesn't give us a free pass to mess up. We still need to obey the word, period. All right, Jesus continues, verse 4. These, these religious leaders who didn't even believe Jesus was the Messiah, they're reading the law of Moses, but they are missing all the signs, right? Don't be one of those people. They crush people with unbearable religious demands. You ever met someone like that, right? Make you feel 
really bad, right? They did it, they're ready to stomp on you. They make you feel about this big. That's what these people were doing. They're, these religious leaders, they crush people with unbearable religious demands and legalism, a bunch of rules that people can't even follow, right? They never lift a finger to even ease the burden. Have you ever met somebody like that? Perhaps that's why you've been hurt in church. I mean, I've known people who live in bondage because of this kind of garbage. This is how a lot of cults operate. They use legalism and scare tactics to control people. All right? We're not going to buy into that, but we are going to follow the word. Verse 5, he continues, everything that they do is for show. On their arms, they wear these, they're called phylacteries, all right? On their arms, they wear extra wide, these prayer boxes with scripture verses inside. And they wear robes with extra long tassels. And they want everybody to see them. I mean, they're really narcissists is what they are, these religious leaders and Pharisees. All about the show. There's another portion of scripture I want to read in Matthew chapter 6, and then we'll come back to chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, Jesus says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. He says, when you pray, pray in private. I mean, we're allowed, we're, it's okay to pray publicly, all right, as long as you're not praying publicly for show. And that's what they were doing. Verse 7 says, when you pray, don't babble on and on, basically using idle words as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by just repeating their words again and again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. And then Jesus lays out the model for prayer, but that's a whole nother sermon. We need to pray. It's not for show. The Pharisees, the scribes, the religious teachers of his day were all about show. They were about legalism. They were about rules and regulations. Jesus came on the cross and out of the grave so we could have relationship. The church is all about people having relationship with God through Jesus. All right, back to Matthew chapter 23, verse 6. These Pharisees and these teachers of the law, they love to sit at the head table at banquets in the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to re receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces, and they love to be called rabbi and, and, and teacher. All right, in other words, these jokers were more interested in looking holy and looking important than they were living a life of service. Jesus came to serve. So whenever you are connected to a leader who likes to step on people and walk on people and push people down to elevate themselves, get away from them. The kind of leader Jesus is looking for is a servant leader. Not for somebody with a huge following, but somebody who's willing to sit down and wash somebody's feet. Somebody who's willing to do some dishes. Somebody who's willing to provide a meal. Somebody who just wants to help somebody without receiving any kind of thank you or glory because of it. In verses 11 and 12, Jesus tells us listeners that living a life of humility and service, they are the ones who deserve to be exalted. Let me read it to you. Verse 11, the greatest among you, the greatest among you, I mean, you want to be great? I do. The greatest among you must be a servant. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I mean, there's been a lot of leaders in churches that were about show, that were about exalting themselves and having a posse or having people bow to them and, and serve them. And a lot of those people end up getting humbled. Pride comes before a fall. And as we continue to read this, this chapter, Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is going to deliver seven woes. So, I mean, if I gave this message today a subtitle, it would be um, Epic Tales of Woe, all right? Seven tales of woe. These are seven 
woes. And basically, what's happening in these next few verses that we're going to read, I believe verses 13 to 30, something like that, Jesus is about to deliver an indictment against the Pharisees and against the religious leaders because of their hypocrisy. He is about to denounce their external religion. He is about to denounce their pretentiousness. He is about to denounce their predatory behavior. And these seven woes echo the woes that are given in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28. They were familiar with those because to be a Pharisee and a religious leader, to be a scribe, to be a teacher of the law, to be a rabbi, they had to have the entire law of Moses memorized word for word. So it was interesting that these woes that Jesus lays out echo the woes in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. And they're the opposite of the blessings that he issued called the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. So before I share these woes with you, in in English, hypocrisy describes a contradiction between reality and appearance. That's what hypocrisy is. Now, in biblical usage, hypocrisy is leading people astray and thus incurring judgment. And that's why Jesus is ticked off. Uh, Jesus didn't get ticked off. He sure got ticked off. Remember when he ran the money changers out of the temple? He flipped the tables and cracked a whip. Jesus did and said some things that were, quote, not nice, but they were right. All right? He still loved. He just has a problem with any type of hypocrisy, especially in the church, that's going to lead people away from him. So, again, you've been hurt. I'm so glad you're watching today. I'm so glad. We want you to know we love you and Jesus loves you so much. So these seven woes of Matthew chapter 23, the first woe was found in verse 13. Woe to you, the King James tells us. Now the the New Living Translation says, what sorrow awaits, woe to you, what sorrow awaits, you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. I mean, he's throwing it down right here. (laughs) For you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Wow, there are some people in churches that are going to have blood on their hands because they have ran people, like some of you watching today, out of the church. That's a travesty. That should have never happened. I'm so sorry that you were run out of a church. Jesus isn't happy about it either. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves. And you don't let others either. Why? Because they rejected him. It's the religious leaders that led the charge to crucify Jesus. The second, whoa, just say that, whoa, in your house right now. Look at someone next to you, whoa, right? What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell you yourselves are. I mean, those are strong words right there by Jesus. Now the translation says, twice as much a son of hell as you are. Wow, they were leaving people away, running people away from Jesus. The third woe, verses 16 through 22, I'm not gonna read them, but they were encouraging evasive oaths that amounted to lying. And Jesus' point was that people should tell the truth. All right? Thomas L. Constable said this, Jesus condemned his critics for mishandling the scriptures that they claimed to defend and expound. They constantly mishandled the scriptures, and he had a problem with that. This is why we need to know what the word says, and we won't be deceived by lies that sound like truth. The fourth woe, verse 23 and 24, these woes, they dealt with the legalistic hypocrisy of the leaders. These Pharisees, they tithe faithfully. Jesus said, should you tithe? Yes, but they did not practice the important things. Jesus said, we should tithe, but we should not neglect the important things like justice, mercy, and faithfulness of heart. These were the people that they strained the gnat but swallowed the camel. They had had issues. 
They tried to point the speck out of somebody else's eye and they had a big plank sticking out of their own eye. We can't neglect the important things. And there are some, some preachers that will stand on TV and, and make somebody feel this good, this big, I should say, and not good for not tithing when they themselves are jerks. I mean, that's not cool, all right? And there's some really good people on TV, so I'm not just bashing anyone that's on, on television, and I'm not saying you, can't ask, you shouldn't um, ask for money. We give people an opportunity to, to, to pay tithes and to, to give offerings so we can continue to do this, but we're, we're not manipulating people. We're not, um, we're not trying to make a, a mockery out of, of giving and um, a, a show out of it and... Um, you know, we're not, we don't have any tricks up our sleeve to try to trick somebody into giving and, um, just don't neglect the important things, right? All right. The fifth woe, verse 25, 26, they were diligent in following the laws to be ritually and externally clean, but they neglected the filth of their own greed and self-indulgence. I mean, Jesus, he doesn't, he doesn't hold back, does he? I mean, he is full guns blazing right here. He, is, he does not like hypocrisy. So we want, our new, want you to know hypocrisy in the church has nothing to do with him. The sixth woe, verses 27 and 28. In an effort to help visitors who had made the pilgrimage, pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover, the local Jews, they would whitewash the gravestones, making them visible so that they would not be touched for doing so would make one unclean. And the reason that Jesus makes this illustration is because the Pharisees, they prided themselves when it came to observing the law and they were all about outward appearance. When Jesus said, listen, God doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at your heart. And have you ever had somebody in a church condemn you for what you were wearing to church. I just want you to know right now, I'm going to set the record straight. Jesus doesn't care what you wear to church. He cares about what's in here. I'm wearing a hat today. Most of you watching, you didn't even think twice about it. Why is the preacher wearing a hat? But for some that are uncomfortable right now, they are caught up in legalism. Man-made rules rituals and regulations. Jesus doesn't care whether or not I'm wearing a hat. So don't even give me, well, God wants you to wear, wear your best to church. That's nowhere in scripture. Jesus does not judge by outward appearance. He looks at the heart. So when we open our doors back up again, you come as you are. Ripped jeans and all, wearing a hat. We don't care because Jesus doesn't care. Ironically, the Pharisees' failure to understand and apply the law made them lawless. And Jesus called them wicked. They made a lot of emphasis on dotting every I and crossing every T when their heart was far from him. Jesus said, a lot of people, they honor me with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. That grieves him. You know, on Twitter, there's so much out there. And um, it's kind of like a big train wreck, but I can't look away. Uh, so I, I, I'm on Twitter. And honestly, it's, it can be used for a lot of good. And you can have conversations with, with people that, um, that normally you would not have access to. It's just really, really cool. Um, you know, you got to be careful with all social media platforms. But um, I, um, I enjoy tweeting and Twitter. And... Um, I follow this account, it's at fake sermon, at fake sermon, and it is IFB Preacher Clips, Independent Fundamental Baptist, and it's by someone who is wanting to expose the hypocrisy within that denomination. And the only reason why I'm sharing this, because I think it's going to help illustrate why Jesus was angry, and I'm just going to read you a couple of tweets. All the tweets on this account are, are sermon clips of preachers today that are modern day Pharisees. 
They're modern day hypocrites. They're caught up in legalism and rule, man-made rules and regulations. They're caught up on, on what Bible translation you use. And if you're not KJV, then it's not the word of God. And they have bought into some lies of the enemy to hold people under their thumb. And, and they, they bully people and they're rude. And it's, it's honestly, it's crazy. I just, I, 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 I can't even believe some of the things that I watch and I, I read on there. Um, just give you a couple of examples. One of the pastors in his message said, be careful of the devil's deception. Like questioning your church, like questioning the preacher, like questioning the KGV and the old hymns, using those 7-Eleven modern songs instead. And it's just all about methods. The slogan the mission and vision of Rock Church, same message, different language. We're not going to mess with the message. The message is the word of God, the gospel, right? But we will have to change our methods to reach the people we're trying to reach. And we've been forced to change our methods over these last few weeks. We're coming to you live in, with a video camera right now. That's a different method. Again, God doesn't care about our method as long as we're not sinning, right? He doesn't care about our, what our method is. What he cares is that we don't add or take away from the word, right? So Jesus doesn't care whether we're singing an old-time hymn or a new modern song. It's not about style, all right? But these churches make it about style, and they elevate style above the word. And there are a lot of messages that, I, that I've seen on this site. It's, there's no scripture. It's just... Pharisaical. Another example, we need to be doing what we've been doing, back to old-fashioned worship in the KJV Bible. They're taking the pulpit down and getting a rock band. Can't tell if you're in a honky-tonk or church. And what they fear to realize is all the old hymns were honky-tonk songs. <laughs> I, love what, I love what Rick Warren says. He says there's no such thing as Christian music, just Christian lyrics. Right, the words are important. The beat doesn't matter. But here's another guy. He said, "You have to be extremely careful using canned music in church. It may have a worldly beat in it, so you should check it out first. I, I have one question: What's a worldly beat? Again, I don't think God cares about the beat. He cares about what's being said, and He also cares about how we're being, how we're living. All right. I have a friend that." And I've shared this with, if you've been coming to Rock Church for a while, you may have heard me share this story, but it's a sobering story about a friend back in the day. I, I reached out to his brother and I kept, kept trying to get him to come to church with me. This is a church that I was a part of as a teenager. This is not Rock Church, but years and years ago. And I just was trying to, you know, plant some seeds and witness and any opportunity I could to try to reach out to, to uh, my friend's brother. And... Um, He's a good guy. He just he just didn't have Jesus, and um, he had man real long hair, real long beard. I mean, he definitely could have been a sit in for a ZZ Top video. And I always invited him, and he all said no. I, I didn't stop inviting him, and he didn't stop saying no. And finally, one day, I just pushed back a little bit, and I said, "Hey, man, how come you won't come? You know, um, why are you so afraid?" I'll never forget what he said. He said, a couple years ago, I got invited to a church, and I went. It was like one of these churches that I just read some examples of. He said, I was pretty afraid. I was nervous. What are they going to think when they see me? But I still went. And within the first few minutes of being in the service, I was approached by a leader and he came up to me and he said, hey, we want you to know that we're really glad that you're here. But please don't come back unless you cut your hair and shave. And he said, that Chucky, that's why I've never been back to church. And that moment I was grieved. And I had this righteous indignation rise up, just like Jesus. Woe to you. 
teachers of the law, you hypocrites, you brood of vipers, you snake, you frauds. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And after you do, you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. Those were the words of Jesus. So for those of you like my friend who you've been damaged in church because of legalism and man-made rules, I just want you to shake all that off and know today that Jesus loves you and he is so for you. And he loves you just the way you are. He doesn't ask you to believe before you belong. He doesn't ask you to behave before you belong. And at Rock Church, we're not going to ask you to behave or even believe. You're just welcome to belong. We want you because he wants you. And I'm, I'm pretty much out of time today. I don't have time to read the, the seventh woe. But you can read them for yourself in verses 29 through 30, Jesus ends the series of woes by calling the leaders out for pretending to honor the prophets and martyrs of the faith when they were rejecting the teachings of, of Jesus. We know that as evidenced by this passage that we've read from today, that the the letters to the churches in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we don't have time to read it. The teachings of the Galatians, when legalism was addressed, to the, to the Colossian church where heresy was addressed, where the, the book of 2 Timothy where leadership transition tensions were addressed. You look at Philippians, the church of Philippi, and it was dealing with conflict and selfish ambition. And then you go to First and Second Corinthians and it deals with pride and arrogance. We know that God has high expectations for the church. It's also obvious that the church dysfunction is not a new issue. But God is still God and Jesus is still Jesus. I said it earlier, where there's people, there's problems. Relationships are messy. I'm going to close with a, fro for, uh, a quote from my good friend Mike Craw, who's on our team. He's one of our elders at the church who's part of this tech crew that's bringing the service to you today. He said something to me a while ago, and I wrote it down, and I want to share it with you. He said this, Don't let someone who didn't die for you affect how you worship someone who did. Jesus is calling you right now. I just want to encourage you to say yes. He came for those who know they're sinners, not for those who think they're Righteous. That means a church is not full of saints. It's a hospital for sinners. So come on and join us and watch what God will do in your heart. Let me pray for you. Father, right now, I just thank you for this time that we've had together today. We thank you for the work that you've been doing, stirring some things in hearts. Even some people right now perhaps could be sitting alone in a home with tears in their eyes because they realized that the hurt that was done to them in a church by somebody who was supposed to be a pastor who was trusted did something that was not of you and you're not happy with it and you don't condone it. And I just ask you to heal every single hurt, heal every single heart. Today, we confess you, Jesus. We surrender our life to you. We confess with our mouth, Jesus. We believe today, our faith is in you, that you really did come out of a grave, that you're still alive. So because of our confession, because our faith is in you, we are saved. We belong to you, period. It's not about dot and I's and cross and T's and following this and following that. It's simply about surrendering our life to you. Your word says that when we sin, we confess our sin. You're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So today, we just ask you to forgive us. We're sorry. So we thank you that you remember our sins no more. That in you there's no condemnation. So we thank you for what you're going to do in our church and in the church as a result of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, listen, once again, we want to thank you so much for being a part of this online community. I want to encourage you, if you don't have the Rock Church mobile app, to, to download it, whether you have an iPhone or an Android. 
go to whatever, whether it's your Google Play Store, whether it's your, your app store on the iPhone, and just search for the word Rock Church, as in one word, app, the second word. Two words, Rock Church app. Download the app because we are starting a community and we have some things um, behind the scenes and hopefully next week we'll be able to share with you to where you'll be able to post pictures on the app and be able to communicate with each other on the app, be able to share prayer requests on the app. So I'm telling you this, get ready, get the app. That way next week you'll be able to, to start up with us. All right, I'm done. I'm preaching. Um, I'm done preaching. Thank you so much for, for being here. And um, Pastor Teresa is getting ready to come to the stage. But before she does that, we want to honor some people. If you're a first responder, if you work in healthcare, so many other different things, we just want to say thank you. So um, this tribute is for you. Just like the video we just watched portrayed, we want to personally thank our local heroes, hashtag for the 309. We also want to remind you to use the hashtag for the 309. Go ahead and post pictures of you doing church with Rock Church today and tag us in it. We also want to remind you that Fuse has a live service every Sunday at 3 p.m. You can go to the Fuse Rock Church Facebook page and get the link for that if you have kids who are Fuse age. We'd love to have them join us in our Zoom service every Sunday at 3 p.m. Also want to remind you that we have four ways to give. You can continue to give to Rock Church even though you're not physically in the building. The first way is through our website at rcpeoria.org. Number two, our mobile app, our Rock Church app. Number three, you can text the word Rock Church to 206-859-9405, or you can send it in the mail to us at 1081 Upper Spring Bay Road in East Peoria, 61611. Make sure that you're visiting our Facebook page every day for posts and information. Let's pray for our offering. Jesus, thank you so much for this day, for this time of worship that we've had for your word, Lord, and just for this chance to share everything that Chuck had to say today, God. We just thank you so much for the opportunity to have church even when we can't be together physically in the building. Lord, we ask your blessing on the offering that's going to be collected, God, that it would meet all the needs of Rock Church. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys have a great week. We'll see you next time.